once again to Traces of the Lost World. Today we are going to talk about how the scientists collect all of these wonderful pieces of information and work with it so that the information can be transferred to common people like us and we can learn about all of these findings. Dan, can you tell us a little bit about how you come to collect? Okay, one of the, <coughs> to get the specimens from the field back to a museum where they can be studied, um, we have to collect the we have to collect them all, um, and the way we do that is we break them out of the rock or we dig them out of the rock, and depending on the kind of rock that we're collecting in depends on the various approaches that we use to obtain the fossils. Do you, do you go out a lot in the field? Yeah, as much as I can. I, end up, I don't know. Every year I go out. Um, I probably spend probably end up two months, two and a half months out in the field each year. So when you come in and collect this amazing information, how do you collect, how do you decide what to take? And is there a limit on what you can take? Well, there are limits. Um, the size of the rock is one thing, and the amount of storage space that we have in the museum is another thing. Um, the we have a rock, we got a specimen from Iowa, which weighs 16 tons, and that's the whole crown of a tree. And we needed that specimen because it has the crown of the tree and it shows us a lot of information on about the, the form of the tree, what was growing on the different branches and things like that. With the specimens that we have here, these are small fragments um, that came from a much larger plant but all we find are small fragments. And we can study in the ground, we can study the specimens that are here, but we only need to take back to the museum a uh, small sample, a small piece of rock that is a voucher specimen that will let us know that these are the things that occur here. We don't need to take 16 tons of this rock back to the museum because we can't store it. And the amount of information that we would get from having 16 tons of this rock um, is, would not be worth the effort, one, in collecting it and getting it out of here, nor would it, uh, nor could we justify storing that much material in, in, in the museum. museum. So there are two different questions on the size of a, of a collection, and the idea is to get <clears throat> a sample that will give you the information that you need to do the study that you're involved in. So that's why uh, we just need to get. Also, the other thing that we need to do is we need, as this is a national monument, we need to preserve things in the field so that others who come out to the national monument to look around can see things in place and actually look at them in, in outcrop, out in nature, because you see a totally different relationship than you would see in a museum. For example, sitting here, we have uh, fossil plants that are on this rock surface here and if you look further down the arroyo there underneath the bush down there you see ripple marks that were formed when the water was very shallow and the wind was blowing across the the surface and it formed the the mud when it was mud it formed them into ripples well you don't you can't see that relationship in a museum you can only see that here in the field and that's part of the story that is trying to be preserved in the national monument here Thank you. That makes a lot clearer how you choose those pieces to take to the museum and share with everybody. It, of course, will never be compared to seeing it in its environment, but it will give us a very good idea of what you found. Yeah, nobody ever got a tan in the museum. What, what do you do when you, when you are not out in the field? What it's like to be a collector on the... <laughs> when, you, when we're back at the museum, um, in many ways, it's, it's very much like being in a, a standard office setting, mm -hmm. except that what we do is we, we study the specimens, we take care of the specimens that we've collected in the field. We, uh, when we ship them back to the museum, we have to unwrap them and put numbers on them so that we can keep track of where they came from. Because a specimen without, uh, without the information of where it came from is worthless. It, it, you might as well not have collected it. So it's important to get that field data with the specimen and to maintain that. With, so that's what we do a lot of the times when we're back at the museum, is, is making sure that the collections that we've made are, are well documented and that that documentation 
is permanently tied to that specimen so that somebody in the future uh, can come back and look at those specimens and know exactly where they came from. Um, one of the, the things that happens in science is that what we know today lays a found, uh, foundation for where we're going to go in the future. And, the, and a lot of times collections that we've made in the past are from places where we can no longer get collections from because there are, there are a lot of places where actually housing developments have been built over oh, where no. we got collections before. And so you cannot go back and make additional collections. And that's one of the things that's important about monuments like the one that we're in, mm -hmm. is it preserves these rocks for all time from being paved over and, and losing them for, for future researchers. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, it's, science is something that you know so much today, you find out a little piece of it today, and then tomorrow you'll find out another little piece. And, and isolated, they don't seem to do anything. And somebody will have a third piece, and pretty soon you can start building a house out of this thing. And pretty soon a bunch of these little pieces of information come together, and it actually means something. So that's what all the collecting and all the field research that we do is about, is to, is to Putting get, together. Yeah, get little pieces to put them together to make a to make an understanding of the, the history of the earth and, and the history of life on earth. Well, there's, you know, the thing is that the plant story here is also really interesting in, in, in how it adds to the history of the earth and the history of, of the way uh, North America has evolved and the, and the plants and animals that live in North America at that time. I mean, it's, it's all important. You know, there are, there are things that stick out. But all of this stuff is all part of a, a much bigger framework of things. And so, yeah, there are, there are things that stick out in your mind as being the most interesting and fun things to find. Uh, but it's all, all equally important. It really is. What is the other area of collecting and how they go about actually getting these pieces? You know, it's interesting because I've been out in the field with uh, another paleobotanist of... Uh, Bill DeMichaels, Scott Wing. And out in Wyoming, the lithology is a lot different than it is here. You notice the blocks are a lot thicker here. But in Wyoming, the type of material that we look for, as far as plant fossils are, are concerned, is called carboniferous shale. It's a lot thinner than this. And usually what we do when we go out into the field to collect fossils is we go out, we find the locality, and we do prospecting. And once we find some carb shale, we, start, we stop right there, we take a look at it, and the blocks are not as big. The, the blocks are about maybe about that big. Mm -hmm. Take a small piece of it. And like, for instance, we have a, we have a block here. It's, it's, some of the blocks are about this size. And one thing we use out in the field uh, in order to get to the fossils is called a splitting hammer. And we take a splitting hammer. And you notice these bedding planes here? Mm -hmm. You usually try to split along the bedding planes. That way you can get to the fossils. Like, for instance, if we split open like this and if you see a fossil on either one of these blocks we hand it to the curator let him take a look at it and while he's looking at it if he feels that it's important enough to collect then we wrap it up right away now these blocks are a lot uh, they're a lot thicker not only are they a lot thicker but they can stand um, they can stand weathering a lot more in other words they're not fragile they're pretty okay. pretty dense if you have something like carved shale, it's a lot thinner, it's brittle, and the thing of it is, you can't allow it to be exposed to the sun but for so much, but for a long period of time. You just gotta wrap it up right away. And I noticed that Dan and, Dan and Bill, they use newspaper to wrap the fossils up with. Here, in just in this yes, area? Yes, in this area. But at Wyoming, because of the carved shale fossils that we have, we don't use newspaper. We use, believe it or not, toilet paper. Toilet paper. Yeah, call it TP. <laughs> what we do is we wrap the fossil up. Once we wrap the fossil up in TP, then we mark it, and then we wrap it up in, t in paper towels. Then we wrap it up, in after we wrap it up in paper towels, then we have boxes we carry out with us in the field. And then we put the specimens in the boxes, then we take the boxes back to the campsite. Once we get them back to the campsite, then if we have enough boxes to take into town, 
We take the boxes into town. And we have a good uh, relationship with the uh, Bureau of Land Management in Worland, Wyoming. That's where we store all, house all our um, equipment and stuff. And so once we get the boxes back to the warehouse at the BLM, we have crates sitting on a pallet right there. And then what we do is, after we get the boxes back, we put the boxes in the crates. Then after we put the boxes in the crates, we seal the crates up. Then we ban the crates to the pallet. Then in, instead of having it shipped by air, we have it shipped by truck. It goes truck freight and it comes back to the museum. Now, not only do have I uh, collect, wrapped uh, specimens out in the field, but this is what I do back at the museum. I'm a museum specialist, and I've been doing, uh, I handle all the shipping for the uh, Department of Paleobiology. Coming in and out from the museum? Right. Okay. And I've been doing this for 31 years. And so I've packed everything from microfossils to large dinosaur bones. And sometimes if I have to pack, pack large dinosaur bones, I have to build my own crates. So I have my own office with my own shop, have my own tools, and I build my own crates. And um, like I said, I've, I, the largest thing I've ever had to ship is a Triceratops skull. And so I had to build it, I had to build the uh, panels around the base of it mm -hmm. by, uh, uh, by using plywood. And then once we build the frame around the base of the uh, skull, then we just secure the skull by using uh, two by four braces brace the sides to brace the uh, length of the skull, make sure it doesn't move. And then we put a lid on top of it and then we have it shipped out. So this is extremely important. It's not just about coming out to the field and finding right. samples, but how to take care of them and exactly. make sure that they are preserved the correct way exactly. so that they make it to the museum and then we can see it. That's, that's very true. And I think that's very important because one thing about fossils that people need to realize is that fossils are irreplaceable. It's not like you can go to Kmart and find <laughs> another fossil, exactly like the one that you find out in the field. They're one of a kind. And so in order for research scientists to be able to get to look at them, uh, and, order for, and also other museums to be able to, to put them on exhibit, if they need to borrow them for exhibit, we want to make sure they get there in one piece. So shipping them is just as important as collecting them. Can you show us some of the tools that you use and how do you use them? Sure. Uh, one tool that we use out in the field is called a splitting hammer. And here is, here is a, a piece of rock that's sticking out on the outcrop here. And as I use a splitting hammer, what I usually do is I can either go this way with the blunt end of, end of it or I can go this way to try to dig it out. So to save time, I'm going to go ahead and try to smash this out. If I can, hopefully this will stay intact. There we go. Here's a good piece right here. See the bedding surfaces here? This is where you use the tapered end of the splitting hammer. And you just take it and you just split it until it comes open like that. And hopefully when you split it open, you'll be able to see a fossil inside of it. And uh, that's what we usually do. And then if you find fossils, like in this particular section here, uh, the curator usually takes a GPS, that's another device that we use out in the field, and they'll orient where this particular locality is, and then they'll, then they'll plot it on a map, so that if they have to come back to this particular spot, they can just use the GPS coordinates, and then what they use on the map, and they can find a way back here without getting lost. Thank you very much. That's a very, very um, simple way of seeing all of the work that takes not just, you know, find a piece, take it with you, put it in your bag. Right. It's a lot more. It Thank is. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Not very easy for me. To <laughs> Thank you. We'll see you back for our next episode of Traces of the Lost World. Thank you, Lily Rosa. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.